The immovable rod is an uncommon magic item. On one end of the rod is a button that, when pressed, locks the rod into space wherever it is, even if it's just in midair. It requires a DC-30 strength check to move it, and it can hold up to 8,000 pounds. But today, we've put together a few public service videos to warn dungeon masters of the increasingly chaotic and terrible ways in which the immovable rod is being used in games. We will start first with the warning signs that your players may show if they intend to utterly abuse this item and potentially ruin your life. Let's roll the clip. So since we're all starting at level 5, you can each choose an uncommon magic item to begin the campaign with. I'll take the ring of jumping. Ring of jumping? I'll take the rope of climbing. Rope of climbing? I'll take the immovable rod. Why did you say it like that? I'll take the immovable rod. Okay. Immovable rod. Done. How long is it? What? How long is my rod? Does it not say in the item description? No doesn't say. Okay, um, how long do you want it to be? Let's say five feet. Three feet. Four feet. Four feet it is. I am going to crush you. What have I done? You may have noticed some of the classic signals already. The immediate request for the rod. The insistence on the rod being longer than it needs to be. The look of mischief and perhaps evil in the player's eyes. And of course, the blatant assertions that the player would use the immovable rod to ruin the dungeon master. This is a good time to note that we do not recommend giving an immovable rod that is longer than two feet. This is for reasons that will become clear shortly. Now we will show you a series of videos that demonstrate how the immovable rod can be used to destroy a game or to crush the will and spirit of a dungeon master. Note that we are presenting these in subjective order of severity. We are saving what some are calling the orbital strike strategy for the end of our program. DM viewer discretion is advised. Okay, so you're all in the cargo hold of the infamous tabaxi pirate Milkbeard's old and decaying ship. It appears, though, that they've undocked, and you feel the ship begin to accelerate in the high winds. Are we below the waterline? Um, yeah, you're, you're in the cargo hold, in the bottom of the hull. So I'm going to orient the immovable rod parallel to the direction that the ship is moving, and I'm going to activate it. Okay, you activate it. Um, well, I guess that means the ship's interior hull would crash into the rod. The rod can hold up to 8,000 pounds. Oh, well, the ship's more than 8,000 pounds, for sure. So, but now I gotta ask, would an old ship like this withstand up to 8,000 pounds of pressure on a small area without breaking? I guess you're right, now it, it wouldn't. Yeah, uh, okay, so the immovable rod pierces through the hull of the ship, and it now begins to take on water, and uh, it seems like it will eventually sink unless the hull is stopped up. Now can I say that I deactivated it right as it pierces the hull so it doesn't get lost at sea and, you know, hurts a turtle or something? Fine. Okay, give me a dexterity check, but it's going to be a high DC. That is a nat 20. Are those the, um, the dice that I gave you? Yes, they are. Great. Uh, yeah, you are able to save your immovable rod and the ship is still taking on water. As you saw in this clip, the immovable rod can have unexpected uses that have the ability to completely derail an entire voyage. We do recommend noting the rod's max weight limit of 8,000 pounds and its implications for future encounters. Let's go on to the next clip. Now that you've swam into the shallows, you can face off against Captain Milkbeard, who says, Arr, you may have sunken me ship and drowned me crew, but I can do the same to you. And he draws his sword. We're already in initiative, so that makes it... It makes it your turn. So I want to use my movement to run up behind the cat pirate guy, and I want to use my shove action to push him down on his chest. The shove action. Um, okay, yeah, give me an opposed athletics check. That's a 23. Okay, that beat his, and since you were behind him, he's going to fall prone onto his chest. You said that we are in some shallow water. Yes, I did say that we were in shallow water. So you would say that he's currently underwater. Yes, I would say so. Great, so I action surge, and I'm going to plant one end of the immovable rod against his back, and then with my full weight on it, I'm going to activate the rod on the other end. Dear God Almighty. What strength check does he have to beat? Uh, yeah, he needs to succeed on a DC 30 strength check to move the rod. His strength is plus 3. There is no possible way for him to even get close to a 30. Yeah, that's what I thought. So he's just going to drown. Oh my God. Yeah, pretty much. Who are you? I am your worst nightmare. 
we can generally recommend a few ways to prepare for this. First, you could make your bosses extremely strong, capable of achieving a DC 30 strength check if they needed to. Note that that is a strength check, not an athletics check. Second, you can give important NPCs the power of teleportation or at least telekinesis to press the button on the end of the rod. You can, of course, also have minions press the button to free the enemy. And while some DMs may not have allowed him to fall prone face down, this is why you need to limit the length of the rod, so that if your NPC is prone on their back, they can still reach the button to deactivate it themselves. And of course, while water was used to invoke suffocation rules in this example, any NPC, even on dry land, that is stuck prone and surrounded by player characters is most likely going to die a terrible death. And with that, a quick word from our sponsor. Today's episode is sponsored by Eldritch Foundry. Eldritch Foundry's free web-based character creator lets you design and order personalized lifelike miniatures for your tabletop games with extraordinary levels of detail. The character creator itself boasts a vast array of weapons, clothing options, mounted units, and fully posable forms, meaning that creating your own fully customized epic miniature for D&D or other TTRPGs is just a click away. You can choose from printed miniatures, download STLs, or even opt in for their subscription option if you want unlimited downloads, which is great if you have your own 3D printer, for example. To try it out yourself, you can go to eldritchfoundry.com, which is also linked in the description. And while you're there, you can also join my free weekly email digest of nerdy stuff called the Arcane Almanac. It's packed full with all kinds of fun stuff, like the alchemy section, which has fantasy-themed cocktail recipes. You get a dice of the week. We've got riddles. We've got a D6 table of fortune. It also has a self guided adventure and more being added every month. So go check out the Arcane Almanac and thank you again to Eldritch Foundry for sponsoring today's video. We will now show a compilation of several quick scenarios before we talk about what some are calling the orbital strike strategy. Let's begin. I hold the rod above my head with my finger on the activation button as I test the room for pit traps. So I take the rod and I shove it up there. So I conceal the rod up my sleeve and then I challenge a barbarian to an arm wrestling competition. So I activate the rod in the path of the cavalry, about chest high for the riders. I beat him over the head with the immovable rod. So I throw my hip and rope over the activated rod to use that as a pulley to hoist him out of the hole. As you can see, the immovable rod does have a multitude of uses, but they all pale in comparison to what you're about to see. Pay special attention to how the dungeon master allows themselves to get caught in this trap. And I've been told to tell you that what you're about to see is of particular danger if you've not yet used an immovable rod in your campaign. In other words, if there's not yet any precedent. Here we go. And you feel the ground shake as the Tarrasque crests the horizon. Do you mind if I ask a quick question? Uh, yeah, sure. Would you say that the days in this world are about the same as uh, the length of our days here on Earth? Yes. And would you argue that the planet we're on in the game is about the same size as uh, our planet Earth? Also, yes. Okay, great. So listen. In D&D 5th edition, creatures fall at a rate of 500 feet per round. And a round is 6 seconds. And fall damage is 1d6 bludgeoning damage for every 10 feet fallen. You with me so far? And if you say that this planet is a similar size to Earth and that the days are the same length, indicating the same speed of rotation, then the surface of the planet would be traveling at a rate of approximately 1,000 miles per hour, or about 16 miles a minute, or about 1.7 miles every six seconds, which again is around, and that translates to about 9,000 feet per round. And 9,000 feet per round is 18 times faster than the fall speed of 500 feet per round. And if we assume that the max fall speed of 500 feet per round would also represent maximum fall damage of 20 d bludgeoning damage, then the speed of the planet's rotation would create about 18 times the max fall damage. And since the max fall damage is 20 d6, that would make the damage dealt by the planet's rotation to be about 18 times that, so 360 d6. And so, I would like to place myself due east of the Tarrasque on a hill so that I'm approximately at its chest height. And then I activate the rod, which as the planet spins would deal about 360 d6 bludgeoning damage or an average of uh, 1,260 bludgeoning damage. If I allow this to work, you understand that there is a chance that it causes a minor cataclysm. Yeah, I'll take a cataclysm. Okay, fine. Um... You splatter the Tarrasque. Ooh, that was hard to watch. That was hard to watch. We hope that this video has served as a proper warning and education for dungeon masters of all kinds. Tune in next time for another DM public service announcement or DM news or whatever, whatever we're calling this.